Ladies and gentlemen, we've made it to episode 80. And let me just say this episode brought to you by Doug Lowe's birthday. My dad. Yes. A Papa Ball game, 75th birthday yesterday. He taught me everything I know about the game, about smiling, about music, about movies. Uh, I love you, Dad. He's in North Carolina uh, listening to this pod. So uh, if your dad is still around, give him a call today. Talk some ball. Uh, give him a hug if you can. Um, this one's this one's for all the dads out there. Uh, so I wanted to throw that uh, out right out of the gates. We got a great guest, Chopper. Uh, that's a tease. I'll tease his name in a second. But how are you? uh on this beautiful january 23rd i'm doing well happy birthday to mr low he's a legend pepsi sipping hawaiian shirt wearing uh legend so uh yeah that's awesome happy birthday to him and uh yeah i'm doing great excited for today's show very excited for our guest i'll keep teasing that uh, but yeah it's gonna be a good one yeah it uh it's gonna be like a home game uh we had flicky on last uh last episode and this guy's name's Jeff Francoeur, nicknamed Frenchie. Uh, Frenchie. And boy, oh boy, um, it, it, he, of course, is a great athlete growing up in the George area. Um, Could have went and played college football at Clemson, decided to go first round to the Braves where he had a cannon and he was known as the natural. Uh, and uh, everybody listening to this pod, you've seen him play the game. But man, oh man, I can't wait to talk to him about what he's doing now. He's got a podcast now called the Pure Athlete Podcast, and he's all about our message. How do we make youth sports better? How do we empower and educate this next generation of parents and coaches? Um, he's super passionate about it. So it's going to be hard to um, push pause or stop this conversation. We're going to roll um, and we'll go as long as as we can uh, until he's got to get out of here. But uh, right at the top, before he he jumps in, um, I, I wanted to a shout out my two daughters. Uh, I am a dance dad, uh, you are. and we they had our their first dance competition uh, of the season Saturday, and it was uh, eight to five, baby. You know, you, you make them breakfast, you get them uh, to the gymnasium there, and you sit uh, in some bleachers in a gym for you know what feels like twelve hours. And about four hours in, I went on Amazon and I ordered some some bleacher uh, padding seats. You know, those little seats with a little back uh, gives you a little soft cushion on the bee honkus because uh, you got to hunker down for dance season. There's a lot of weekend competitions and um, I just I just love watching them dance. And I tell them that, you know, just like we ask our parents to tell their kids, just just say, I love watching you play the game. Um, I let them know I love I love when you mess up. I love those little quirks and mess ups. It's it's a great uh, way to learn, um, and, and uh, it it seems to work because they get out there in front of all those people and they're smiling and they feel comfy. Uh, so I love being a fan. I love being a fan of my daughters. So uh, dance dad, uh, all the dance dads out there represent. Uh, I, I love you all. And then two, I just got back from Florida. I'm repping my Florida coffee mug here. I had uh, three sandlots nice. in the Tampa area. We did, uh, we did Lakeland, uh, and my boots on the ground there went by the nickname Muddy Boots uh, because he wore some big boots and it was rainy, so he had to get out there three hours early and rake all the dirt and the mud. So his boots were muddy. Add a boy, Muddy Boots in Lakeland, uh, Coach Golf Cart and the First Lady in Palmetto. Uh, they have built quite the culture there in Palmetto. Uh, there were 37 kids signed up for Little League four years ago, and now they're up around 300, 400. I mean, that's, you have to be, you have to be so selfless and you have to be so passionate about building a culture. Uh, and, and, and I let them know the communities where the kids know the person at the snack shack, where the, the, all the coaches and all the parents and all the players where they all have barbecues on the weekends. It's a different vibe uh, when you've got that. It's a totally different vibe when you're just, uh, you know, on a, on a tournament team and you're traveling around and you don't know anybody. It's a, it, it's a community that thrives there. So 
well done in Palmetto. And then big ups to Eagle Lake, my boots on the ground, Energizer Bunny, uh, who we, she could also be known as Coach Powerhouse because she's an absolute powerhouse and her husband, the big truck. Uh, they've done the mm -hmm. same thing in Eagle Lake. They have built a great uh, culture and they brought me in. Uh, there's some good feed on the web, on the uh, on the Instagrams and, and socials from from those sand lots, specifically in uh, Eagle Lake. Uh, it, there's some great mullets if you're into that. Um, that's some great accents, some great nicknames. So uh, I love my little Tampa swing. And then a, a big shout out to Coach Vish, who is my college uh, teammate uh, in uh, at Brown University. He was a catcher. And he opened up his doors. Uh, his oldest daughter actually let me sleep in her room. She took the couch. So a big add a girl for her uh, as um, as they opened up their doors. So appreciate that, Coach Vish. That's all I got at the top. Um, before Frenchie jumps on, what do you got going on in your world, Chad Chop? Just, just uh, baseball, man. We're uh, coaching up the PR Pups and uh, played really well last weekend. Uh, had a incredible uh, contrast of when it all costs versus when the heart at all costs uh, against uh, an opposing team that has a known reputation for just being when it all costs. I Seems couldn't like you run into this every weekend. Pretty much. This was the worst I've ever seen, though. Um, you had six or seven adults. First of all, it's way too many coaches. It's basically a one to one ratio. They have 10 kids and seven adult coaches that we're yelling and screaming at every opportunity, yelling and screaming at the kids, the umpires, the opponents. Um, they they brought two of my kids to tears. Um, and uh, specifically, why? How, how did how did how did uh, yelling at umpires and their kids transfer to tears from your kids? I, my wife brought it up, and I think she's right. It's just intimidating. It's intimidating mm -hmm. to see seven grown men yelling and screaming at their kids at our kids um yeah really bad so it was kind of cool at the end of the game they beat a six to three really good game um and i made sure our kids knew like what's important to us and and i brought up a couple plays where we showed resolve and uh and had a big moment where we were fundamentally sound and made a great play and like that's the win for us and it doesn't mean we're not going to compete we're going to compete our tails off but um, it was a really cool thing to be able to address. And some of the kids I had to talk to them about what you do when you encounter that, when you encounter a mean coach or a mean person or a bully. And it's like, hey, dudes, just say a quick prayer for them. And uh, they're going through something. They don't really like themselves a whole lot. So um, that's a good opportunity to uh, to almost feel sorry for them instead of feel attacked. So our I'm guest sure is he here. Probably, I know, man, he's here. He's jumping on. I'm I'm sure, Chopper, that you had some anger in those moments and you had to take a walk and uh, and then, you know, come to come to a reasoning, because if you've got a coach on the other side yelling uh, toxic energy, uh, making your kids cry, it's easy to match that energy with some some negativity of your own. But, you know, uh, salute to you. You're able to take the high road. We're going to put a pin in that because our guest is here. Um, and man, I'm pumped for this one. This is episode 80 for us. Uh, they call him Frenchy Jeff Brancor. Can you see us? Can you hear us? I got y'all. Y'all got me. There's oh, yeah. that voice, baby. I love it. Uh, <laughs> I got you. Um, man, thanks for coming on, spending a, a little time with us. I feel like this is a home game because your podcast, which I've already talked about, the Pure Athlete podcast and ours, it seems to be going down the exact same road. How do we make youth sports better? How do we how do we educate? parents uh with with young athletes in the house so um I'm, I'm excited to get into that conversation uh which which we will do down the road most of our listeners are coaches in little league uh, or travel ball presidents of little leagues uh parents of a little leaguer or a travel baller so good conversation but uh first i gotta introduce you to my partner in crime that's chad chop uh, Chopper, uh, I think you guys have played against each other. Oh, you, yeah. You probably, you probably had a couple of chin waggles. Sally League, dude. Yeah, Rome Braves versus the Savannah Sand Nats. That was uh, must-see television. That team was loaded. 
Yeah, dude, that was our <laughs> our first game in Rome. We went down to Savannah to open the season, and I remember, man, it was just like there was the one, the only stadium that actually did not have like a visiting locker room. So we had to change at the hotel, go to the so field. Bad. We had the small locker room, and then after the game, we had to go back. But uh, it was a lot of man. I, the minor leagues were still and and I know you can talk about this is still some of the best memories I've ever had in baseball with the guys the bus rides like you know it, it was pure that's when it was just pure baseball man it was fun funny story about Grayson Stadium dude there was no home locker room either dude we got MRSA it was brutal our club he got fired it was bad Grayson Stadium, historic Grayson Stadium. Yeah, not, well, now, not the, ideal. now the Savannah Bananas have turned it into a must must see TV, man. Yep, yep. Um, I was looking down our our list of former uh, uh, former guests, and a lot of them um, intertwine with both of you. So Chopper, uh, after his playing days, he, he coached at the major league level with the Giants. Just missed you, uh, and yep. then he went to the Dodgers, but. Former guests uh, here, you got Pete Moylan, uh, who I'm sure you have a story or two about, <laughs> Frenchy. Uh, Kinsler, uh, he was on the pod. Nick Hunley's been on twice. Uh, and then all those giants, uh, uh, Hunter Pence and B. Craw and, and Belt, um, uh, just to name a few. But uh, it's good to have you on, and um, uh, I'm excited for the conversation. I, I, before we get deep into it i'm I'm stealing yours because i listen to your pod a lot and you always ask your guests what are you up to now so i'm gonna go right there uh, where do we find you and and what's cooking these days well first i gotta say guys i'm honored to be on here i'm big fans i follow it you know uh, i think uh, a father of four kids now for me 10 8 5 and 3 you know, I want to give my kids the experience that my parents gave me. And I continue, and we'll get into it, but it shaped me as a person, as a father, as an athlete of how to handle yourself. And so honestly, you know, I, right now, I'm, I mean, I'm, dude, I'm coaching two flag football teams right now, coaching a travel softball team for my daughter. My youngest is five years old, or my youngest daughter. I got a three year old son, but my five year old daughter, so I'm coaching her T ball team this year, which, we had the first uh, practice the other night and it was a train wreck, man. It was beautiful, you know, it just, <laughs> a beautiful train know, wreck. Like, yeah. And, That's yeah, how you have to look at it. Train wreck. And, but <laughs> so, so I'm just having a blast doing that. And actually I took a step back this year with the Braves. Um, so I've done a hundred, 110 games for the last five years. And uh, I'm going to do, I think 25 Braves games just here and there. I'm going to do uh, 20 Tuesday night TBS games in the playoffs with them. So I'll still be involved, but I, I had to get home, man. I had to find, you know, it hit me this year, really, when I was sitting up in the booth calling a game and I'm sitting here watching Game Changer or FaceTime to watch my kids. And I just was like, what am I doing? You know, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, you know, look, I was smart financially and, uh, Luckily, because of my dad, he didn't give me any of my money when I got drafted or anything. <laughs> it, they, they, it's a good cause. But, you know, so for me, man, I really want to spend the next 12 years investing in in my kids. And kind of like y'all do now is say my passion has become youth sports, man. I've seen what a nightmare it is. I've seen the amount of kids that quit, that don't play at 8, 9, 10 years old, not even 14, 15, 16 at that young age. And I'm like this cannot be happening, man. It's too much fun. And so just like y'all, I've kind of made it a mission to get out there, man, and, and show the good coaches, show the good athletes that th there are plenty of them out there and kind of fight against the train that's on the tracks that is youth sports because, you know, we kind of say, and I'm sure y'all feel the same way. There's no stopping it. I mean, it's a billion, billion, billion dollar business. But how can you educate these parents and coaches that there is a different way to do it? And thank God, uh, former players who have played at the highest level, played in World Series like yourself, like Jay Bruce, who was just on, have come back home, seen the little league they grew up in, and said, "Man, I can't, ha I can't have this. I, I got to do something about it." Uh, so uh, good on you, man, for taking that step back. We, we get it. I, I have two daughters and you get those moments of like, this is fleeting that this, this is gone in, in a second. So trying to slow down these moments is, 
yep. uh, is huge. So uh, let, let's start with mom and dad. They're, they're both educators, retired, I, I do believe, teachers. I believe your whole fa- you got a whole family of educators, uh, brother, sister, all of it. So um, with that, where did the love of – I know it wasn't just baseball. You played multiple sports. Uh, where did the love of sport begin for Jeff Francoeur? Well, I like to say, guys, I was lucky that I had an older brother, older sister. So from the age of two or three, man, I was at parks. I was dragged around, you know, and just loved it. I, I any 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 ball, baseball, football, soccer. Bat, I mean, I just wanted to play, and I loved it. I love being outside. I love everything that came with it. You know, I was getting. Hey, I lost all the time as a kid because I was playing with my brother and my sister. So you know, I was. I was having to fight for every little time I got the ball or did anything, but it kept bringing me back. And so for me, you know, I was lucky, man. I used to sit, uh, my dad was a huge, my dad's from Boston. So he's a huge Red Sox fan. So even though we did have the Braves in Atlanta and it was a great time to be Braves fan, we still would watch Red Sox games too here and there. And we, but we would sit there and my dad would teach me the game. Like that was the great thing, right? Like we'd sit there and he'd be like, why did they go to second right there? And so I think for me, it was cool because I understood the game of baseball from an early age. And that's how I try to coach these kids, even the five and six year old stuff. I'm trying to teach them just the rules, what's going on. Because as I like to say, usually if kids have an understanding of what's going on, they enjoy the game. You know, I, I make all my kids throw the ball to first base. I don't care if you throw it over the fence. I don't care if it 14 hops. That's how you play, right? A ball's hit to you, you throw it to first. You know, I, I my first year T-ball, I'm sure y'all been through this, man. The coach said a ground ball would hit and they'd hold it. Runner first, ground ball hit, hold it. Runner first or second, ground ball hit, hold it. Then if it was like hit to the pitcher, go run and step on home plate. I'm like, these kids have no idea what's going on or why they're doing this, right? And so that was the big thing for me, man. My my mom and dad were teachers, educators for 38 years. My dad, my mom for 30 because she took a few years off. So everything I did growing up was, was a lesson almost. Like, you know, we were going to learn the right way and why you did things. And so, you know, I always say I was very lucky. I had two parents that were involved in everything we did, uh, school, church, to to sports last. You know, that was kind of you know, what we did. I love that. that that's a key word involved. And, uh, and then the second thing that hit me is you're out there teaching these five-year-olds how to throw to first, but I can, I can hear your tone and I can see your body language being one of positivity. And this isn't the end of the world if you mess up. And I think that's absolutely vital for all young coaches. If you're a first time little leaguer out there with a bunch of T-ballers cho- chewing on gloves and 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 eating butterflies, like how, how positive can your tone be? Educate them uh, so they understand the game. But uh, wouldn't you agree that, that the tone and the body language sticks out more in a kid's brain? Oh, hundred percent. And I, I tell all our parents at our first meeting, look, we're going to have a blast. We're going to compete. We're going to have fun. But at the end of the day, if I win or if I lose in a five and six year old game, I'm taking the kids to Mexican after and we're crushing chips and salsa. And I'm, I'm going to be great either way. Like, you know what I'm saying? I, I want them. And, and honestly, when we started our podcast, pure athlete, a lot of what I was trying to do is get that in there. This is supposed to be fun. Like this is Jay Billis was one of my favorite we had on because he was like 97.6, I think he said, percent of high school athletes don't even go on to play college, division three, JUCO, anything. So why are we not making it a blast for these kids? Like what yeah. what when did it become life or death? You know, my my wife, I forget the name, she's reading a book right now that's incredible. And what it talks about is when we grew up, guys. You know, you did extracurricular activities to take stress off, relief yeah. stress, Good school, point. your friends trying to fit in. It is so stressful for these kids to go back that now, though, we're sitting in a sports atmosphere that's almost more stressful than school. So all these kids are feeling is stress. And I said, there's there's no outlet anymore for these kids to just go be kids and have fun. Hundred percent, and I, I think it's important to realize the difference between telling kids we're going to have fun 
and showing them what fun actually looks like. So creating enjoyable practices what, where, where it moves and, and it's fun. And then yeah, we as coaches and parents it, exuding that, like, like the, the emotions of joy and fun and laughter. Uh, I just, I look back to my dad who um, I've said this a lot. He, he used to sit behind the left field fence, played at a high level, taught me everything I know about the game. Uh, no, he knew it way more than any of my little league coaches, but he would sit way back there with an unbuttoned Hawaiian shirt and just drink Pepsi and laugh. And that's what I remember is just his face. And and he showed me what fun looked like. So yep. um, that's important. Uh, you can't just say, have fun, kids. You really have to lay it out for them what that looks like. And especially uh, when they're, especially when they're younger like that, you know, you, yep. you, you know, it as well as I do, you get in a little league practice, man, you have an hour. It's amazing. Like they, they've given us an hour and 45 minutes for, for five and six year old practice. And I'm like, there ain't no way we're lasting an hour and 45 minutes. I'm like, are you yeah. crazy? Yeah. Give us an hour. Yeah. Um, uh, amazing. Well, uh, we, we, uh, we jumped uh, ahead a bit, which we're going to have to do uh, a lot here with, uh, I have, a, I have a whole page of questions, advice, advice for the parent, uh, of travel ball advice for the parent of, of T-ball, Little League, uh, all that. So more teases coming at you, listener. But Chopper, uh, uh, over to you, buddy. Yeah, I just want to comment on a few things that you said. Uh, one of the things, I came home from coaching Major League Baseball to coach a Christian high school, right? And the biggest feedback I got from the players and the parents was, dude, it's not fun. Like half the kids wanted to quit. Um, and they were good. Like it wasn't like they didn't have talent, but it wasn't fun. To your point, that really hit me when you said like when we were younger, it was, you talk about your coach and flag football. We just did that out in the front yard, dude. It would, and if there was a car, we'd step out, but it was sometimes there was an all time queue if the numbers weren't even, but that's just what we did to have fun. And it was daily and it was by choice. And now it is freaking business and it shouldn't be business yet. Um, you said it, Frenchie, when you get to college, it's business. Uh, you skip college because you're a savage, but you get to pro ball. It's, it's business. So like when they're younger, dude, it's gotta be love of play. And if you're good, you'll go wherever you're supposed to be, wherever the good Lord wants you. So for coaches. And, and like I said, i got to come home and coach at a, at a high school and it was like, Hey, we're going to work our tails off and we'll have confidence through preparation, but we are going to have so much flipping fun. It's, it was praise God. See it mod after every game, we were going right to have a pizza party. Mod pizza, and, Bro. Yeah. We had, we had squirt in the dugout. I had a tower of candy and it was like, whatever y'all want, y'all want, uh, watermelon sour pitch, sour patch, say less. You want a giant tub of bubble gum? Say less. You want sunflower seeds? Yes is the answer. What's the question? You know, yeah. and that was kind of our vibe. And then sure enough, the success followed, but it was it was the culture that was set of we're going to work hard and we're going to play hard. We went full Wiz Khalifa, the clean, the clean edited version, but it was work hard and play hard, you know? No, um, I, but I no totally agree with that. You talk about, we had a, a guy named Dr. Neary on from Emory who did a great one with, just the injuries in sports because of specialization. But one thing he talked about was what you said, free play, which I love. He's like, kids would get 10, 10 boys in a yard, split up five and five. They don't need us, man. We just mess it up. And, <laughs> and that's, they know how to do it and they play. And like you said, when they're tired, we're good. We're done. Yeah. We'll go home. And, yeah. and there's not, there's just unfortunately not enough of that. You just I want had to give Greg you... Maddox on, yeah, and he was talking about that. He had 12 starts a year, and he's playing basketball and other sports throughout the year, but he's not hes not wearing out that arm at an early age, yeah. He didn't even play baseball in 7th, 8th, and ninth grade. He didn't I play mean, softball, bro, softball only. Yeah, that's crazy. Softball and then played basketball, and I'm like, uh, timeout, last I checked, he's, what, the fifth winningest pitcher in the history of our game and, and, and can move a ball – more than anybody else I've ever seen. So I'm like, here's the guy that did it, you know, and, and you try to tell him, right? Like not everybody's going to be Greg Maddox. I get it. But the fact of the matter is, you know, he had a blast doing it with his buddies and that's, that's what we want, right? That's what we want for our kids and other kids. Yeah. I want to give you credit because having played against you, I could, I could feel that joy and love of play that you exuded. Uh, I, the talent was off the charts. The bat speed was crazy. Uh, you could fly, you could throw, and you were a kid. I was shoot. I came out of college, a four year senior, so I'm I was a man, and you were you were a man, but you were a young man. Uh, mm -hmm. But but even just your smile, dude. I remember I was telling Coach Ballgame, you and I ended up at the same Applebee's after a game, and like I could feel the love of Jesus exuding from you 
Um, and that's powerful. How, how, has that always been something in your life that that just kind of just making sure you exude that? Uh, or did that was there a, a big part in your life where that took a leap? For sure. You know, it, it was funny, man. I a lot of people don't know this story, but, um, you know, so I, I grew up going to church. Like I said, it was going to be church for us. It was going to be school and then sports. And um, so, you know, I did all that, but my, my second year in minor league baseball, man, my life completely changed. I got hit in the face with a 96 mile per hour fastball in Frederick, Maryland. And I mean, I had seven and a half hours of surgery, shattered my eye orbital bone, my uh, nasal passage. Like it was bad for two weeks. They, you know, the doctor was kind of like, we're hoping that your eye comes back. You know, as well, the, it's hard enough to hit with two good eyes, much yeah. less if no one could have thing. But my mom was always in the hospital every single day with me, man. And she would read Joshua one nine. Let's go. Said, I commanded you be strong, courageous, do not be discouraged or afraid for I'm the Lord, your God, and will be with you wherever you go. With and, you. and I mean it, man, from that moment on, it was like, whenever I got an AB in the big leagues, whether it was like, you know, if I had to pinch hit or if I was starting, if whatever, like, thank you very much. Like, thank you for playing this game. Thank you for this opportunity. And, you know, but I, I was, man, my, my parents, you know, they, they expected me to have fun to, to, you know, enjoy what I was doing. And so, I, like I said, again, I was very lucky because they were involved and I had great coaches where I was at, man. I really did. Like I had coaches that, you know, pushed you in a good way. But also, man, you knew that they loved you and they were there for you. So you didn't care, right? Because you knew that they had your back. Love that. That, that trust, uh, building that trust is A, number one. Uh, and I, as I go around the country and try and chat with coaches, I say, spend 15 minutes when they arrive just talking to them and build yep. that trust up. How you doing? What's your nickname? How was your day at school? How are things at home? Because they will go to battle for you when you challenge them if you've built up that trust. So uh, that's key. That kind of gets me to my my next spot in your story, which is state titles. You, you get to high school, uh, you won two football titles, you won two yeah. baseball titles uh, at, at in high school. Uh, aside from the talent, which was obvious, what was so special about that group of athletes? Man, we all grew up right? Going to the games, going to the high school games, like Friday night, man, my buddies, my dad, we would load the car. We had an old Caprice classic dude in 1984. Beauty. Just beauty. Beauty. <laughs> called it, called it the blue hog, man. It was awesome. And, <laughs> and we would load that thing up and whether the high school football team was playing 45 minutes down the road, third, we went. And so like from the age of six years old, man, I thought that was the big leagues, right? Like we watched this, like, this is what we want to do someday. No different than baseball. We'd go to seven, eight home baseball games a year and watching the high school guys. So I was fortunate, man, that all of us grew up. This is what we wanted to do, but we all played together. Like I tell people all the time, I didn't play East Cobb. Like people can't believe that I did not play East Cobb. They're like, oh, you're from Atlanta. You must have played East Cobb. I didn't, I didn't want to travel around the country, man. I played with my buddies on the travel high school team. We'd get worked, man. I'm telling you, we'd go to some of these tournaments and play these Cobb teams and we'd get crushed. But I, I was playing with my buddies. I was playing with the guys I was going to play with in high school. So I didn't care, right? Like I was still playing. I was getting experience from, from doing that. And the great thing was when we got to high school, man, so many so all our football teams, this is one of the greatest things because now you go, how many football leagues have an A team and a B team? And oh, yeah. some of these kids never even play. Yeah. We divided our two teams starting in the second grade equal. So your two best players, which mostly were your quarterbacks, we were on separate teams. Two runs, so everybody kept playing. All of a sudden, eighth and ninth grade, man, everybody that went through puberty, everybody developed, they kept playing. So my junior and senior year, man, we went 15-0 and 15-0 in the largest classification in the state of Georgia, which, you know, wow, you know, Georgia, along with California, Texas, Florida is probably your four biggest powerhouse football programs. And then in baseball, we were 34-1 and and 35-2. and um, So I literally lost three games in those two sports my junior and senior <laughs> year. And I mean, there's no doubt it was it was like a fairy tale. But I tell Bill that we had great players. Like the guy that hit behind me in high school, Billy Howard, he went to Georgia and played first base. He was a hell of a lot scarier than I was. Like 
Like I had pop, I could do it, but like he could flat just roll out of bed and get hit six, seven times in high school out of 10. So, but all of us grew up playing together and we yeah. had fun man. and everybody's parents knew each other and everybody was involved. And so it was like, man, it was the perfect time. Culture. Uh, again, as I referenced this a lot going around the tour uh, and I go to a town where that vibe is, is palpable where the the person working the snack shack knows all the kids and all the kids know that person and everybody knows each other by name and they go eat barbecue uh, after games. Um, it's a different vibe and it, it gives this joy factor within the kid's brain where let's keep doing this. Let's keep yeah. going. Let's, let's move forward. Cause I'm with my buddies, I'm playing and that culture gets set, which, which is great. Um, uh, I'm, we're about to hit that MLB career here, but uh, chopper, uh, what do you got? What do you got for us? We touched on it last week with culture and we talked about like winning, like how do you win? Is it what's first? And it's culture. It's, it's fun. It's, it's creating the, I don't want to say illusion because it's not an illusion, but that attention to detail is fun. Right. And you can make that fun as a coach of like, like you said, Frenchie, like, all right, dude, we're going to teach you guys how to play because then it's not a boring game. Everyone says it's boring. They just don't know how to play. They don't understand balance and that every base has to be covered on every play. And if you're looking for that, you gain a competitive advantage and all of a sudden you become savages and you know where your teammate's going to be before he's even there. And you can come up with a hard pump fake and flip behind your back to the shortstop. That's at third that like, how the heck is that shortstop at third? Well, cause you've been playing together since you were six and you had a coach that yep. taught that and made it fun. So we're doing it right now, Frenchie, with my 10 year old and his group, they play football together. They play basketball together. They play baseball together. And us as coaches, we're already talking about like, Hey, dude, football coach, can you secure this high school job as a football coach? And I'll yeah. get the baseball head coaching job. Yeah. And Tommy DeMore will be the basketball coach. And then all of a sudden, you don't have that infighting between high school coaches. Like, no, you can't have it. It's like, no, no. These kids all do it all and they love each other and they won't, they can't wait to compete. So I love and, culture. And I is love, huge, dude. And the, you know, the biggest thing you just said that, that is, is like my life mission with the youth sports is multi sport athletes. Yeah. Like, the idea that you just said, my kid plays three sports. He doesn't yeah. throw all fall and play all these travel ball games. He doesn't spend Christmas in January, you know, doing hit and drills six days a week. Like right. you know, these kids have to have a break, man. They got it. They got to be able to do it. You know, my wife went to the university of Georgia. So of course, you know, right now being a football fan for university of Georgia, I mean, it's just a powerhouse and, but I love what Kirby Smart, the first thing he said at recruiting day, when they signed their class, he said, 25 of my 28 guys, multi-sport athletes in high wow. school. Yeah. And if that doesn't hit home, right? If, if you're not listening and say, my, my daughter loves softball. It's all she wants to do. I coach her team. Most, I've already told her this next fall, you got to find something else. We're not playing softball next fall. She's 10 years old. I'm like, you, you so we're going to do tennis. She, she wants to play Love tennis it. with friends that do it. And I'm like, we're doing it. I said, I'll still every once in a while I'll take you to hit. We can do this stuff, but we you're stepping away. Yeah. Uh, that, that made me think, uh, push pause listener and go to the Pure Athlete podcast, Dabo. That, that episode, uh, you talk about a guy that's built a culture at Clemson. Uh, but it, I, I just had a notepad and I just kept writing down notes. Uh, he is looking through that right lens. So that's a great one uh, to listen to um uh right there um well uh, you decided not to go to clemson to play football uh, you get drafted first round by the braves uh and out of the gates you you, you came out hot and uh, uh they they called you the natural uh you were free swinging and you had that cannon from the outfield and uh it looked like you were just having the time of your life um but it wasn't always up it, it, uh, it was ups and then it was downs and then it was back up and then it was slumps. My question for you, because I think this really can impact coaches, uh, what got you through the downs? Uh, the, the ups are pretty good. It's easy to win, but um, was there a person, was there a coach, was there a mentality, a teammate that got you through the, the slumps? My old man, dude, my pops, mm. man, we, he was my go-to. We talked, we talked after every single game, minor leagues, big leagues. You know, there was one rule when I got married with my wife. I said, after the game, I drive home by myself. Like, you can come with me. You can ride home with a friend. But like, and, and it was a healthy thing because by the time I walked through that door, 
I was able to flip the switch and be a different guy. I'm out of baseball, but I have to have time. You see now, dude, there's guys after the game that are gone five minutes after the game. I'm like, how do you switch that mentality? I can't do that. But my dad, you know, man, was my go-to. And we talk through things and you do it. And I think in baseball, you got to understand, man, you are just going to flat stink sometimes, right? Like, I mean, it, you really are. I mean, think about this. Two years ago, no one ever said a bad word about Mike Trout. Now, half these people, he's washed up. He's done. I, th- I think, and I'm like, it's one of the greatest players of our generation. First ballot Hall of Famer. And it's quick how they forget. But for me, man, it, it was, I, I, you know, I got up for two and a half years. I hit 30 home runs, drove in a hundred, two years in a row. And I'm like, man, this, this is great. You know, like this thing's rolling. And then I hit 2008, man. And I couldn't hit water. If you thought of a boat, like it was like, I completely forgot how to hit pitchers started just exploiting me, chasing, you know, expanding my zone. Then you're trying so hard. Seems like O2 every time you step in the yep. box, you know, we've all been there, but you know, for me, I think between my dad and then, you know, Katie, my wife, we, we, we've known each other since third grade. So we actually started dating senior high school. And, and honestly, I, I tell people this, you know, my, my relationship with Christ and my faith and being grounded in that combined with that made, it just, it made me realize that it's not everything, right? Like I loved it, um, but it's not who I was. It didn't define me. And so I think that helps, man. I mean, I'm sure y'all both know people that baseball is everything. And when they get out, I got buddies that I play with. They're lost, man. They don't know what yeah. to do. It's like they don't know their wives anymore. I know some that have gotten divorced. And it's like, I I never wanted to be that guy, right? Like, so so for me, I found happiness in other things because I, if you you know this, if you if you want to find happiness just in baseball, man, good luck. Because you, yeah. you are going to be in for the ride of your life. Yeah, that's what got me. And that's what helps me as a coach today, especially with kids that want to play at a higher level, older kids, high school kids. It's like, you got to find a positive. You got to find something that you can go into tomorrow with that you can be grounded in this gratitude that you found with Joshua 1.9 and that going through a hardship. So it's like, hey, if something went wrong, process it like you did with your dad. But then you've got to be able to flush that. And then you've got to have something that when your, your head hits the pillow, you're thinking positively. And when you wake up, you're ready to get back out and grind. And that was something that as a player, I kind of didn't have the ability to do. So it helps me as a coach of like, there's no money in negativity, dude. You've got to find a positive and you've got to be a good teammate. You're so right. And I'll show you two quick examples. Bobby Cox, the greatest manager I ever played for. You talk about a leader, knew how to empower guys, when to, I started my second year off two for 36. I mean, it was a bad start. We were in LA and San Fran out West. I was bad. I come, we come home three games. I was bad. I get called into Bobby's office, right? This is coming off my rookie year. I'm 22. And I'm like, Oh boy, this isn't good. (laughs) Bobby looked at me and he said, Frenchie, no matter what happens the rest of the year, you're playing right field for me every single game. I'm running you out there, buddy. He said, so go relax that night. I blooped one in the next night, two bombs, man, a multi. And I just took off but he knew when to do it. You know, I, I struck out and I missed a slider by, I mean, a foot. I knew I did. I walked past him and he's like, Frenchie, you're right on it. And I'm (laughs) like, I, I actually stopped. I stopped at the top of the dugout. Brian McCann was in the hole. He can tell you this. And, and I go, Bobby, no, I wasn't. I said, dude, I missed that pitch by a foot. And he looked at me, he goes, no, you didn't. You're right there. And, you know, I sat down and I'm like, well, maybe he's right. Maybe I'm on it, you know, but those were little things that here it is, the big leagues, right? You're getting paid to do this, but he still were doing things that we should be doing at the little league level. To That's just right. Keep up. Like he empowered you. He gave you that confidence that it's like, I can do anything. Yeah. A kid, a, real Bang, quick. Let me, be, let me touch yeah, on. Yeah. Go get uh, so I have kids that'll swing at a ball over their head. You know, and my thing is, I love the thought process. I love you being aggressive. You know, we'll, 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 let's get it down a, a hair, but like, I love that. Stay aggressive, you know, and it's, you're right. It's that so many other coaches, what are we doing? Yep. What are you swinging at? And then you've ruined that kid. So are you there for the kid? Or are you there for yourself as a coach? And then they're tense and they're going to take that pitch. They're done. Right the that you need yeah. to, you need to and then they hate it. And then they don't want to do it anymore. And then they're going to go to, they're, they're going to go do something else. And yep. then we've lost them. Yep. And furthermore, you can look at a line like um, swing at strikes. 
And that those words can be said a lot of different ways, but Tone. most of the time those words are said, swing it strikes. Yep. And immediately the kid, they're not going to process those words. No. They're going to process they're a failure. And my coach hates me. So it, that or throw time, strikes ball game, throw, throw strikes. strikes. And you're like, Oh really? Oh, dude, you don't think like, what, you, what do know? we, what yeah. do we got? Yeah. Like you didn't think that that was uh, my intent, but you know, that's why I love doing our podcast because it's taught me a lot of stuff with this. And, and I mean, listening to y'all's and other people, it's changed how I coach man. Two years yeah. ago, I would get on my daughter when she was in the plate and it just made me realize she shuts down when I do that, man. She gets, yeah. she's a whole different process. So yeah, we'll talk at home, you know, the next day, yeah. You know, hey, let's let's start going through some of the bats and pitch selection. But I realize when she's in the battle, man, if I do that, she's done. I, I can go ahead and put a fork in her. She's got zero confidence and she thinks I don't believe. Yeah. I love that story about Bobby Cox. And we just had Jay Bruce on. He talked about Dusty Baker. He was a savant with people. Like he yep. just knew he 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 knew every player, had built trust, had gotten to know them, and Bobby just knew you enough to know that right time to to say what he needed to say. Just become a savant with people. I love that. Um, Chopper, I'll throw it to you. What do you got? Uh, dude, I, I just love, I'm enjoying just the back and forth. I'm enjoying everything, all the insight that you're saying. And like you just said, Coach Ball, being a savant, talked to Dave Roberts last night, and that's another savant, right? Mm -hmm. So it's it's these folks that, and the funny thing, both Dave and I laughed is like, we're not the smartest peanuts in the turd, but like we're elite at that. And Frenchie, it's something that we learn as coaches, coach ball game. And I learn every day and it's, I'm so different today than I was 10 years ago when I first started coaching high school, before I got back into baseball as a major league baseball as a coach. And it's like, I always thought you had to be disciplined and hard. And the Bible says you discipline those you care about. So that's what I hung on to, but no, dude, you've got to win the heart. And it's got to be about the heart. And yeah, you can have some discipline, but discipline's got to be timed and tone is critical. And just making sure they know you build relational equity is the play. What are some keys that you do as a coach where you can build relational equity? Is it a drill? Is it a question? How do you build relational equity with your players? So I tell my girls, my son's team, I tell them all the time, the only time you will ever hear me yell at you is for two things. If you don't hustle, and effort. you have a bad attitude. Yes, attitude and effort. And, you know, we had Dan Orlowski on our, our podcast, and I love what he said. He said, I push my kids in the controllables. That's what I do. I want to discipline my kids in the controllables. Attitude, hustle, being a good teammate, you know, listening when your coach or someone else is talking, all that other stuff. And right, like that's what I started. Same thing changes a coach. I remember used to, be, let's get a hit right here. Well, you can't control that, man. You might skull a ball right at the shortstop. And it's like, you just had a hell of an at bat. It didn't turn into a hit. So let's change, you know, hey, let's let's square one up right here. You know, yeah. let, let, different tones with kids that that resonate, right? Like, like that's what, and, and knowing that, like, I'll be honest with you, my dad and other people, they could coach me hard. I liked it. I did. Same. I loved when someone got on me hard. Now, now, for me to respect it, I knew they had to care about me. That's right. Love me as a, as a person, as an athlete. But if I if they did, I wanted them to get on me hard. But I also know that I have buddies, I have other people that aren't like that. That 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 if you push them, they shell up and they're done. So I truly believe it's one of those things. Like you got to know your players. Every single person's built different. And if you spend enough time with your kids, which you should, if you're a coach, you should know out of 10, 11 people, how do I motivate this person and how do I motivate the next? And the other thing I'll say is, is, you know, I love what Dabo said when you're talking about that podcast is if you're going to coach, know what you're talking about. Know, know what you're, know what you're doing, right? Like what you're telling the kids to do. My son is loving lacrosse right now. I'll be honest with you. I don't know a thing about lacrosse i know now more because i've done it the last year studying and watching them but it's great i i can sit back i actually enjoy watching him while other people coach but i think those are all things that you know control the controllables with your kids but man we always say love them hard coach them hard and hope they sign back up next year and as you get and as your kids get older and they get to that high school level and, and hopefully you're coaching high school if that's what you want to do one thing I told my high school boys, and it's from building relational equity and having accountability. So like to you, I, I completely agree with what you said. If 
I knew someone loved me. I'd run through a wall for him and I wanted them to hold me accountable. So I tell my high school guys in those moments when you don't like me, don't forget that I love you. Yep. Right. And it's uh, that moment, you know what I mean? Of like, Hey dude, yep. you don't need another friend. You need a mentor. You need someone that's going to hold you accountable. But like, I've shown you how much I love you and I would do anything for you. And I would run through a wall for you. Um, so that, that's a big one. We talk about it a lot, but I love it. Frenchie. What do you got coach ballgame? Love it too. And, and uh, don't underestimate the power of an apology. Uh, when yeah. I overreact, um, <laughs> group, come together group. I am a grown man. I'm going to put my walls down and I'm going to say I'm a human and I messed up and I'm sorry. There's a lot of trust built there. There's some relational equity built when you can uh, meet them halfway with, I talk about this a lot on the, on this podcast with my daughter. Um, she, she breaks down when it's firm, when it's loud, I've got to meet her halfway. I've got to, I've, I've got to make it a two way street. Um, and those are the moments when, uh, when we really break ground. Um, one of the cool things about being a journeyman, Frenchie, is you get a lot of teammates, a lot of great teammates. And I was looking down the list of of the Chippers and the Smoltzes and the Glavins, McCanns, R.A. Dickey, uh, Ichiro yeah. for crying out loud. I mean, you 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 ran the gamut. Um, do you have a kindest teammate? Uh, somebody Love that stands question. out was super kind. Lou Kochaver. He's my best friend in baseball. You know, he was with Kansas City Royals. Uh, we go up and see them every year. We're actually going to Italy this summer with them to celebrate. Ooh, uh, where are you going? Where are you going? Uh, uh, are you going to Rome or Florence? Or? Yeah, we're, we're doing it. We're doing Flor uh, Rome, Florence, and then down to the Amalfi Coast for, for four days. Well it's done. Cool. Yeah. Never been, so I'm looking forward to But, you know, my my two best friends, Lou Kochaber was just um, a dude that you want to hang out with every day. You know, he loves you. He He's positive. He you know, he cares and, uh, you know, and, and you know, it because he's, like I said, he's, he's my closest friend that I played with in baseball. Love it. Um, the, these are some quick hitters, best BP who, uh, and maybe this was an opponent, but somebody that stopped the, stop the press. Let's go watch this guy take BP. 16 when I was with the Marlins, John Carlos Stanton. I mean, the, it's yeah. just ungodly how far yeah. he can. Well, I, I actually felt like I was a horrible player during BP. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, can you put me in a different group? Uh, Chopper, you you pitched a lot of BP for the Dodgers and the Giants. What about you? Who's the best BP? Uh, uh, Hunter Pence could put on a show. Uh, but like Frenchie said, Giancarlo, dude, like that's, I think, the only guy in my life where I, I saw him up close and I was like, he looks like a statue, dude. Like he looked like a Greek god. He, yeah, he and I'll tell you this. So what you said with Hunter Pence, he is the most wiry, strong human right? being I've ever seen. Like it's 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 scary actually. He's going boom every swing. Boom. Yeah. yeah, and it looks horrible doing it. <laughs> I love it. He's the best. Different. Boy, he was, a he was a great. He was a great interview, man. The, the he's a beauty. Like, my bad, man. I, he's you'd a sit beauty. I have to tell stories for 15 minutes. You'd walk away scratching your head like, God, this guy's from another planet. Another planet. And then don't ever get him Starbucks. I once got him Starbucks and he freaking looked at me like I was the biggest a-hole on the planet. Because that dude is not drinking Starbucks. No. He's drinking top shelf coffee. Um, I, I, I think this is a similar question to BP, the best golfer, uh, that you, that you teammate, uh, who you got? I'll tell you what, man, Smoltzy, he's the most competitive you've ever seen. It's unbelievable. You know, I got a chance guys. I was lucky. I played with Tiger Woods six times back in spring training. Okay. Let's Sorry let's about go. it. Subtle flex, subtle and flex. It, it, it's a flex. I mean, dude, it was, uh, it was as cool of an opportunity and stuff, but Smoltzy by far. But I will tell you, the last two years, there's been an MLB tournament in Cabo that Wally Joyner's put on. And it Love is Wally Joyner. Last, and we have so much fun. And Jeff McNeil is by far the new best golfer. He just won ever. in uh, Orlando. Oh, he won all right, dude. He lefty or righty? Lefty. Crushes, Plays lefty. Okay. Crushes that. Wow. Wow. Okay. Indeed, I, I'll tell you who else. Tyler Clippard's not far behind too. Tyler Clippard can can go low. Yeah, love it. I love it. Um, Buster for me, ball game. Buster's nice. He played in Pebble Beach. Buster, Buster was Buster was good. Matt Kane's good. Yeah. But Will Smith hits it four hundred yards. 
Will Smith, actually, since you brought him up, he's the best. Yeah, he. we were playing with Pujols and Will Smith, Frenchie, and Pujols blasted a ball right down the middle, and Will Whoa, Smith hit serious. the ball, the catcher, right? Will Smith, the the, the real Will Smith. I, I actually love Will Smith, the pitcher, too. Um, I used to tell Dave Roberts that all the time. He was my man crush in baseball. I, I think Will Smith is just the most underrated, best all-around catcher, does everything, mm-hmm. and he gets no credit. I sent Will Smith uh, our lineup uh, – in 2019 and it was the wrong will smith because i had them both in my phone and uh <laughs> he's like, hey nice. chopper i think i think you sent this to the wrong will smith so i put i changed will smith with the dodgers to the real will smith real on will my smith. phone it would be funny if i would have sent it to the actor or something i'd have been amazing would, yeah. <laughs> but no so pool nuts a ball we're in pittsburgh and he hits a ball just down the middle and then we're, we're all like dude nice nice that was sick and then will smith hits the ball 150 yards farther it, it was like four fit it was crazy and then yeah. his short game's nice will smith's the best coach Baldwin, thanks for reminding me of that i would have yeah. got worn out for that yeah. it's will smith nick punto for me punto can hit it i mean we oh. we've played in a tournament at uh pelican hill two years in a row and he's i mean he's 320 played with ian kinsler in dallas he's right there like they're both flying at 320 330 but there's some good golfers out there. Yeah, little, man, baseball, it's those short arms. Baseball guys. and hockey. Baseball and hockey. Yeah. It's two sports with the good golfers. The short arms, dude. I'm telling you, everyone we're talking about has got these little Mike Trout alligator arms. <laughs> what What do we not know about Chipper that made him so great? Oh, that he could just flat roll out of bed and rake. But what people don't understand, man, is he studied the game. You watch Freddie Freeman, you know, Freddie Freeman was a little just brother to Chipper if you watch him. And so this year, I want you to pay attention to those Dodgers games. Do you ever see Freddie go to an iPad? Do you ever see him going to? Nope. Watches the game. Top step and he watches the game. And Chipper was the best at that, man. He never went into any of these iPads. He watched the game, could tell you everything you need to know. And that's why I tell him, he, Chipper's the best hitter I ever played with. He's also the smartest player I ever played with. And I'll never forget Aaron Heilman, great pitcher. He went to Notre Dame, right? So I'm thinking, this guy's got to be smart, right? You go to Notre Dame. Chipper would sit on his changeup every time. Boom, gone. Double off the wall, home run. And I remember Aaron Hammond would come throwing two fastballs right down the middle. He'd take them. O2 changeup, whack. And I'm like, has he not figured out that he's sitting on his changeup? <laughs> but but Chipper, dude, he knew the game back and forth and studied it. And, you know, some of the best nights, man, were on the road when his dad, because his dad's a great baseball man, would come. And we'd go to Chipper's room after the game with a couple beers, man. And we so talked awesome. to him for three hours. It's It's incredible. Chopper, you had Lincecum, right? I had Timmy. Uh, yeah, Chipper's but I had a great Chipper had a great read on on Lincecum, isn't that right? Yeah, but the thing about good hitters, great hitters, I had Barry Bonds in the replay room with us in San Francisco, and I would ask him that, like, "Hey, you saw one pitch, sometimes a series, and hit it out. Like, how did you?" And he's like, "Dude, I sat on a pitch. Like, I I typically sat on the pitcher's best pitch." And if he threw me three straight fastballs, I would take it and I wouldn't care because I knew my next at bat, he would throw the slider and I would hit it into the water. And so those guys, they, they're stubborn, dude. They don't get off their plan. Whereas guys like me and you, Frenchie, yeah, we have a plan. But then it's like Mike Morse would always say, yeah, I'm going to say, oh, abort, abort. And we just swing because like oh, we didn't guy have. On your shoulder, a guy on your shoulder tells you, it's going to be a heater right down the middle. Yeah. Trust me. <laughs> slider. <laughs> Chip, we were in Chicago, Wrigley Field, and Carlos Marmol, I was 0 for 3 with three strikeouts on that slider. And I'm about to walk on deck, and Chipper grabs me. He's like, hey, I want you to auto-take the hole at bat. Or before three, yep. And I'm like, no, he's like, <laughs> auto-take the hole at bat. And I'm like, Chip, dude, I can't do that. And he goes, if he strikes you out, I'll give you 10 grand cash. And so I'm like, all right, that sounds Done. Good. <laughs> I go up there, five pitches, four balls, walk to first base, and I look over, and he's just going like this to me, you know, and I'm like, so that's why you're good. Yeah, the, the four bumper. before three, the four before three is a thing. And so, like, you get some of these pitchers. Scott Alexander's a good example, lefty with that really good sinker. If you can commit to getting the box and closing your eyes, they will throw four balls They'll before they you. throw three strikes. They, they will. Because they're that's... so good at it, it looks like a strike. Yeah. That's tough. That's tough for Frenchie. This is a, a trivia question. Who can name it first? What count did Frenchie hit the most bombs? Oh, on? oh, 
Ambush, dude. Bang. First pitch feeder. Oh, oh. Bro, yeah, what, this guy first. Close. 43 yeah. bombs with an 0-0 yeah. count. And first fastball think... he saw, dude. It's gone. <laughs> first yep. pitch he saw. So when Chipper's telling you that auto take, that's got to be anti everything you're about. 10 hey, grand, dude. That's why he said the 10 grand cash. He yeah. knew he could, he could get me on that one. I'm like, all right. Hey, Part man. of up there wondering, God, should I just strike out? You know, I hope he strikes me out. So um, good. We, what's your hard out, Frenchie? We don't want to keep you too long. Uh, I got about 10 or 15 more minutes. I love it. I love it. Well, um, uh, as far as, as your playing career goes, man, it was fun to watch and, and you, you're able to communicate so many of these stories and, and lessons you've learned uh, in the booth. How was that transition uh, into the booth? Was it, was it tough? You know, what's funny is th this is why, you know, my wife, my wife tells me all the time, you're a much better announcer than you are a baseball player. I'm like, thanks, man. <laughs> Play thanks 30 the years in the big leagues and you're just, just jabbing me like that. But, you know, I always say, right, like things happen for a reason. I feel like I've experienced everything. If you remember, I had to go back to AAA for three months at El Paso in 2014 and fight my way back to the big leagues for two and a half years. And like, so I feel like when someone's in that box and they're on top of the world, I've been there. When they feel like they're drowning and can't get a hit, I've been there. When they've got released, I've been there. When they've won a gold glove, I've been there. I've experienced everything, man. I've been to the World Series. I've lost a hundred games, you know, like, so I think it's made me a good announcer because I, I have a, a a vibe or a feeling of what everybody's going through, right? Yeah. And, yeah. you know, yeah. two things on my scorebook that I write. So I open it and I read it every single day. Number one, don't ever forget how hard the game is. Yes. It can look easy on TV. And number two, don't ever say anything on TV that I once say to the player's face. Yes. And And I always feel like if I can live by those two things, you know, and, and the thing for me, too, is I'm sure you've heard like during the playoffs and stuff when I do, I want to talk about the players, man. We got the best players in the world. And I'm not, I, you know, I'm just not into talking about too many numbers and that, like you can look that up, right? Like you can yeah. look up if you want, but I want to tell you why this guy's hot. I want to tell you why he might be struggling right now or or what to look at in this certain, certain situation. So you know, you kind of get a vibe and you get a brand, but I've also been very, like I said, coach, well, my first two years, man, I talked to a lot of different guys from Smoltzy, obviously, because he's a buddy of mine, but other guys that I respected and and liked, you know, and, and kind of asked him, what, what do y'all like in the booth? You know, like what, what kind of vibes, what, what goes good? So that's why I, I like, you know, I'm not going to be one of these guys that's all rah, rah, everything's positive, you know, because yeah, you have to have a feel for the game. But I also think, you know, man, this is the toughest sport there is, is to hit a baseball. And you got the best athletes, some of the best athletes in the world do it. It's not easy, man. And, and you try to let those people into knowing how hard the game is. Two things that you said that that you write down, are those are it. And you know, being on the plane, like they, you've got announcers that have never played the game and they're saying things about how easy it is and, and it's not. So that's offensive as a player. And uh, that's a big deal. And if you're not willing to say it to the guy, you're going to be on the same plane, dude, unless it's COVID, you're going to share a plane with these guys. And when you walk on there and you, all you did was, you know, you look them in the face. study sports broadcasting at Stanford and you're getting on a plane with guys and you just wore them out. Like, yeah, dude, they're going to hear it. Or us in the replay room are going to make sure they know that you said it. And it's like, yep. You know what I mean? And so, I, no, I, you're all right. The, all those guys, you know, I have a good relationship with a lot of the players and, and with the Braves and stuff. And I've always told them, I said, the only time you'll ever hear me get on you, if you don't hustle, I'm the same yeah. way with my kids. Yeah. I'm the same way with me. If you don't hustle, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll have a good chance at some point. I'm going to have to call you out. Yeah. yeah. You know, you're right. Kids are watching, dude. Sorry. Absolutely. Yeah. You're right. That, that's, that's a, again, right. Control the controllables. Yeah, I love, love I, I love the empathetic lens you, you look through too. You've been there. You've been, you've had that one for 32 slumps. So, oh, you know, God. what that, you know, what that guy's going <laughs> home to and he can't sleep. Uh, and that, that, that makes me a better coach too. You know, when I can lean on that O for five and I can help this kid who's O for four, uh, you know, it, it really does help with the struggles, make you a good coach, makes you a good broadcaster. Yeah, Richie, you well, got to hear, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. 
I was going to say, you got to hear Ballgame tell his stories about like Verlander. He faces Verlander and he builds this like he's going to hit a homer. And then it's like, I can't remember if it's a strikeout or a foul out to the catcher and he no. round of applause. It, it's uh, so funny. You want to know one reason I love ball game? And, and I'm dead serious why I love it. Because you know what, dude? He can make fun of himself. Yeah. And, and I love that. And I'm the same way on air if you listen a lot of times. I'll say a lot of times, and that's why I'm <laughs> sitting next to you. And I said, that was my favorite. That was my favorite. My favorite thing I've ever said was Charlie Morton was dealing last year in like a game. And I'm like, I'm like, you know who the, I told Brandon God and my new partner, I'm like, Hey, he was a third round pick by the Braves in Oh two. And I said, you know who the first rounder was in that draft? And he was like, who? And I was like, he's sitting right next to you calling his <laughs> game. And then of course I had to throw a jab at my other best friend, Brian McCann, because he was the second rounder. And I said, the other ones at home eating ice cream, getting fat. <laughs> <laughs> I love so it. Good. Uh, McCann is getting into golf. Uh, do you beat him on a regular basis? Is it a tough you one? Know it's funny, dude. When we started three, four years ago, when he retired, I was giving him four or five aside and we play even up now. He's wow. got a simulator in his house. So he, he he's, say, he's grinding. Yeah, he's, he's grinding. grinding. Like, I still got two kids, you know, at home some of the days of the week. So I'm, I'm not, my wife gives me two days a week to play right now. And she's like, when the third God one goes bless her. to school, it can go to three days. And when they all go to school, she's like, just drop them off and pick them up. There you go. That. We get, I totally get the young kids handicap. It just, yep. you know, get, get out to the green, putt as much as you can. Um, Short game. Yep. Bang. It. Th this has been awesome, man. And uh, I, have, I have a list of questions, like as far as advice to the different kinds of kids, whether it be little league, t-ball, travel ball, high school. Uh, but I, I pretty much, I think we answered all of them let's, with a. Let's get a you out of here, brush. and then we can bring them back, Frenchie. If you're down to come back at some point, dude, this is I this is incredible. Back, man. I, I, I think I think closing up on that with the coaches, man, because that's what we've kind of hit with pure athlete and trying to do the same thing y'all are doing, man. It's have fun because, you know, people ask me all the time, when did you know you, I'll be honest. I knew I had a chance to play at the next level when I was 17, not when I was right. 12, not yeah. when I was 13, going into my senior year, I went and played on team USA. We went to Cuba, all these guys that were ranked like top 10. And I, I hit just as good. I made the all tournament team. I'm like, okay, now I got somewhere to go. Yeah. But you know what? That was 17. And it's like this need to fly across the country to play in all these things, play with your buddies, play somewhere where you a can play you're not sitting on a bench and you're learning and just keep getting reps man and at the end of the day you're either going to be good enough to continue at another level or you keep playing as long as you can and eventually you'll do something else but you know i, I tell you what guys I, i'm a big fan of what y'all are doing because i just you know what you look around, man, there's not enough impactful people talking into you sports, man. And if you don't fight back in some sort of way or try to give these parents something, I don't know what it's going to be like in 20 years, you yeah, know, yeah. and especially in the college level now with the NIL and coming down, like it's only getting worse. Let let's, let's find a way to let these kids be kids and let them have fun. Love Tip it. of the cap to you, man. And uh listener, go listen to his podcast, uh, 50 or so episodes deep, something around there. And it, it's just it's just milk and meat and salad and good nourishment for, for those parents. It it educates, it empowers, it's necessary. So add a boy. Appreciate it. Add a boy. I was gonna give you an add a boy too. And uh I love it. Thank y'all for what you do. And let, let's try, yeah, maybe this summer something. Uh let's let's circle back. Let's Would get a it. and let's get a sand lot in in uh, in your hometown, man. I I'm, Dude, I hit I'd the George to, area a bunch. I, How uh, close are you? Hey, do you know where uh, Vogel song and uh, Javi Lopez, the pitcher, not the the Braves catcher? Do you know where they're at? Javi lives they, six houses down the road from me. Okay, bad, the they, they keep trying to get me to come out. So like, so right out right. here, right out there is DeRosa's house. All right, and then across the fairway, let's down go. There is Javi's house and Vogel. Bogey's on a little horse farm. Dude, yep. y'all need to come, man. I'm telling you, yeah. so we play golf at 9.30. Javi, Vogey, me, McCann, DeRosa. Let's go. Out. We, we drop balls and go. Well, yeah, we got to. Yeah, we got to get out there. Yeah, Chopper, we're gonna. We'll do. Maybe we'll do an evening sandlot. You know, we'll golf get a field with some golf lights the next morning. Done. Golf in the morning. Book it. Pro yep. Probably gonna have to go double headers uh, on that. Play 36 and then a three hour sandlot. So bang. Yeah. Love hey, it. Frenchie, I just want to say, hey, I'm I'm 
really thankful that God has blessed you. You deserve it. Um, having played against you, I saw that love and that joy. I don't think anything happens by accident. So I'm really thankful. I hope he continues to bless you and your family and you can bless others. So honor and a privilege to have you honored, dude. Really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Y'all too. Keep fighting the fight, man. All right, right on. Kids. Have a great See day, you, bro. man. See, y'all. See ya. Awesome. I love that one, Chopper. Uh, recap. Uh, what, uh, what, uh, what, what's your takeaways from our man, Frenchie? Uh, gosh, it's cool getting to have a, a longer form conversation with him because yeah. y- you assume that he is who he is just based on what he's doing. And like I said, having seen him at a young age, I mean, shoot, when I played against him, he was right out of high school, 18, 19 years old, but he had this kind of grounded gratitude and joy. And so now as he, as he's older now, and he's worn a older man's wearing an older man's clothes, like he's, you see, okay, that's what it was grounded in. That's what that joy was grounded in. And I love it when it's, when it's Jesus, I'm a big fan of it. Cause I'm a big fan of Jesus. So uh, yeah, he's awesome. Incredible what he's doing. A lot of guys in his shoes with 13 year careers, just right off into the sunset and, and make it about them, but he's making it about his family and about impacting youth sports. So he gets it, dude. Frenchie gets it. Can't wait to go out there and hang with those boys. Can't wait for that sandlot. Me, That's gonna you, be sick. Flicky. We'll, I mean, we'll get 100 kids. We'll get those guys out there. We'll play golf. We'll go coach baseball. Come on. Be sick. Yeah. Say less. Um, lo- I loved every minute of that, as I knew I would. That, that was a home game, indeed. Uh, for real, listener, go listen to his podcast, Pure Athlete. Uh, if you've, if you've got uh, uh, this podcast and his kind of back and forth, you're going to become a better coach. hundred Dialed in percent um before we we close up shop we we had a few great questions from a loyal patreon and listener by the way thank you all the patreons if you want to support uh, uh like some of our other uh supporters by all means go ahead and um and and jump on board uh this question uh, is how, how do you balance tough and tender on a baseball field when youth sports has become so competitive uh, it can't always be sunshine and rainbows, uh, so it can't be the participation trophies, just always happy, happy. Yeah, obviously, if, if you're 0-30, the kids are going to fall out of love with the game that way. Uh, so we, we've talked about that with Coach Flicky, that, that winning, um, it can't be the only thing, but it is part of the puzzle. Uh, how do you balance tough and tender? Uh, is, there a, is there a formula? Yeah, we talk about it here a lot, and I'll even I'll even layer in what Princey said about the controllables. You can be tough on the controllables, but there's still the right way to do it. You don't yell and scream criticism, uh, my opinion. You want to yell and scream positive praise. So if I see a kid not hustle or just not showing good body language or not being a good teammate, I'm going to come alongside him. I'm gonna put, I did this last weekend. I'm going to put my arm around him, make sure he knows that I love him, but that we're different, and we're working towards a different level of – giving our very best effort at all times. And, and if we do have failure or strikeout, not coming in and being a drain and making it about us, you've got to come in and find a way to cheer on a teammate and still make it about the group. But that will never, ever come out of my mouth yelling. So mm-hmm. be tough. You can be tough and tender at the same time, in my opinion, because you do it one-on-one and you've built relational equity where you can say, hey, Coach Balgan, come on, dude, like, you, 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 we've talked about this and I know you want to be this different version and I believe you can do it. So let's keep working. Take a deep breath here. Give me a big hug and go in there and cheer on your teammates. And that's, that's being tough, but it's also being tender. I think they can go hand in hand. And get to know each kid. They're all different. Frenchie said that too. Uh, some kids can handle a little more firm while others cannot. And And if you've built that trust, you're going to know, oh, he's not going to respond to this yelling. I've got to come from a different angle next day, uh, quietly. So build it up, build that trust. So I coached my son and you know, this at the high school, uh, his freshman year. And then now he's at a different school with a coach who is a national champ or, or state championship coach, but he's very tough. He's very hard. He's very, and he, he doesn't focus on the heart and that's, he's old school in that sense. Right. And so my son comes home and he's like, dad, you really prepared me for this. Like I'm, other guys are worried about it, but you, you, you've really, the way you coached me, I, I'm, I'm ready for this. I'm not, it's not a big deal. I know, I know what needs to be done. I know his currency and I'm not afraid of it. And so like, I know I didn't love it when you coached me a certain way, but I'm really thankful that you did it that way. Cause now that I'm here, I, it's, it's easy to navigate, which is pretty love cool. It. 
Well done. Well done. Uh, how do you manage parents who do not buy into what or how you're teaching, who idolize their child as a player, reality versus fantasy, uh, and don't follow the proper conduct expectations? Um, what's your gut? Very easy. Uh, set expectations. And if they don't meet them, I thank them for their time and I send them on their way with love and respect. It's very simple. Cancer spread. So if a coach or a, a parent doesn't want to buy in, and it's rarely ever the kid. In fact, it's almost never the kid. 99.9% .9 of the time, it's the parents. And they have that right. But so do we as coaches to set a culture and set a standard. So I just thank them and say, hey, it's just not a good fit. It's, it's all good. And I wish nothing but the best. And if I can help your kid in any other way, if you need a positive reference, just have them reach out to me. But like, it's, that's not how we do it here. Uh, that's how I handle it. And uh, I could, I could, I could uh, piggyback off that and kind of double down. Coach Flicky goes the opposite route. Coach Flicky says, okay, I need to build trust uh, tenfold on this parent. So I'm going to bring them in and ask them to be my assistant coach. And right. That's his route. And it's just lots of coffee and lots of cold beers and lots of conversations to figure out why is this parent like this? Uh, so Love that. You, you've got options. I mean, I guess, however much bandwidth you have to uh, mentally go that route. But um, yeah, he's a master at that. Uh, so uh, again, try to build as much trust as you can with them. So you can come, you can figure out well, how are they going to listen to this? How are they going to respond? Cause obviously there's some trauma uh, uh, in that parents um, past that that's why they're acting out like that. And uh, two, like, I, Oh yeah. And let me, let me just say one more thing on that you've got to practice what you preach and you've got to be what you say you are. So when I had an athlete recently who, who he was, he was playing, but he did, he felt like he needed to go to a different team. And so, um, and the parents are a really good friend of mine. And so he called me and was like worried how I would take it. I'm like, dude, when I say I love you and I love your family, I mean it. So if this isn't the right spot for your son, I want what he wants. If he wants to be somewhere else, I support that and I support him. So it's a good opportunity as coaches to show your heart and show your character. Like we don't own these kids. We don't own these families, but we can choose to love them no matter what decision they make and support them in their decision. And I think that's when you show your heart and your character and that you're genuine. It's like, I don't just love a kid because he plays for me. I love a kid because I care about him. And if he doesn't want to play for me, golly, like go play with somewhere where you want to play. And I love that. And I support it. Bang. Last question. Um, how does a female manager in a male dominated sport continue to push through and succeed despite the glaring opposition based uh, not on actual knowledge of the game, but rather judgment, stereotypes um, sort of thing? Great question. Um, we don't tackle this subject much. And, and I think we should more often because there's a lot of great mom coaches out there. Uh, so what do you say to that? Uh, female manager? I think you control what you can control. And I think that there's potential traps set up with how someone else reacts to you. So stay true to who you are, stay grounded, be prepared, be knowledgeable, be encouraging. And you do all those things and control what you can control. The loud noise or the opposition that's that's chirping. Like I had a fire captain who said this in the academy, he said, you'll be found out one way or the other. If you're good, you'll be found out to be good. If you're bad, you'll be found out to be bad. So stay on the side of good with your tone and your knowledge and your preparedness and how you treat the kids. And over time, it'll take care of itself. It doesn't make it easier, um, but I think it's it's a path where you cannot fall into that trap of reacting to the negativity. But yeah, we have a lot of great female coaches in our little league. And my wife, I say it all the time. She's the best coach I've ever been around. She's incredible. So like, that would be my advice. Uh, uh, women are just smarter. Women are smarter. They're, they're, that's just fact. Uh, my, my Mrs. Ball game. I mean, gosh, I'd be wearing, uh, Miami dolphin t-shirts and jean shorts and, and I wouldn't have a, a pot or a pan in the kitchen if it wasn't for her. Um, so uh, listen, listen to these, uh, uh, ladies that are on the board or presidents of little leagues, uh, they're go-getters and you're right. The good will, uh, will show the cream will rise to the top. So be true to yourself. Uh, preach this message of joy and building character. And at some point, um, the uh, the folks that that aren't believers, they'll they'll buy in. 
uh, just keep leading by example. So right on. Add a girl. Um, Add a girl. Add a girl, indeed. I uh, I got nothing else, man. You got anything uh, to close up shop? Have a great week, buddy. Yeah, that's that's all I got. Don't forget to rake. Let's go. That's right. Um, Are you home for uh, a bit? What do we got? What, what's what do we what's got? in the world what of Coach Ball game? What, what do we got? got? So, so next week is our yearly uh, Ryder Cup event in the desert. So yes, it is. Uh, may, maybe we'll do a Monday pod uh, uh, sure. to get uh, to get in for next week. But then we'll hunker down. Uh, let's get some more guests before they start getting too busy playing the game. Uh, sounds like you had a little chat with uh, Doc Roberts. I don't know if he wants to have a return visit. By all means, he's welcome um so uh throw throw some joe some kelly i know there. joe kelly is uh has said he'd be willing to come in uh by proxy his wife told my wife so that count it that counts that counts more actually i think you're probably right bring yeah. it joe, bring joe it. kelly be great um all the boots on the ground and parents and coaches that i've been seeing uh across the country you inspire me you inspire me and the chopper um and we're gonna keep her rolling baby keep this train I I committed to Roland. I committed to uh, uh, coaching Little League, which will be fun. That, that'll be the first time I'm actually on a, a Little League staff. So that'll be uh, really exciting. It was funny because you I was the biggest I was, man on that field by a well, long I was a pro- shot. I was, approached, I was approached to do it. And initially I was like, nah, I, I coach I coach club, you know, and it's like, it's different and it's not the same game. And I had all these reasons why not to do it. And then, um, I realized really quickly when I boiled it down, that was just my own pride. And so, uh, vulnerability salute. Yeah. So then I, I told him, I was like, you know what, dude, any, uh, in my life, anytime I've made a decision solely based on my own pride, that's, it's never been a good decision. So, uh, yeah. Is it a different form of, of baseball? Is it, I would argue not the realest form of baseball. Sure. But the kids' hearts are real and it's an opportunity to love them and show them kindness and joy and teach them the game. And so, I'm really excited to do it. I have two incredible uh, parent coaches that are going to be, I'm going to be doing it with. I love them, love their kids. They're on my, on my travel ball team. And obviously Boaz will get to play on it. And so uh, I'm excited for the chili billies and uh, all that little league brings. It's going to be fun. At, at l- last question for you. If you uh, put all of the kids you've ever coached into a bucket uh, that are, let's say under the age of 12, um, how many of those 12 and unders will make it to the major leagues? Wow. You hope one. You hope <laughs> one. How many of those, uh, whether that's travel ball or little league, which you're about to embark in, are going to be um, a student in high school? All of them. A father. All of them. A husband. The, right. So it, it really it boils down to you're just impacting lives. Some, the lens. some are a little better than other at, at, the, at a game with a bat and a ball, but it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. They're all kids. Yep. No, I love it. They're all souls. Oh, yeah. yeah. Boy. yeah. Appreciate you, buddy. Have a great uh, week, my guy. Maybe Monday next week? Yeah, let's rock it Monday. All righty. Uh, okay. Great seeing you. Great chat. Thank you, buddy. Attaboy. boy.